We're up and running. Okay. Again, uh, welcome everybody. Um, very pleased to have everybody here today. We had a last minute change in speaker. Um, we have instead Olivia, and I'm gonna let Olivia introduce herself. Who's, she's from the Christine Noble uh, uh, Charitable Foundation as well. And um, we'll let her get started. And I understand that uh, the other lady is got called away last second, right? Absolutely, and yeah, I'm, I'm sincere apologies from us both. So, Trin Son, who's the Director of Operations out here in, in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. So she's been director uh, for 18 years now. So very much been at the forefront of the foundation since, since the very early days when Christina first started. But she has actually urgently gone up to Hanoi for some business. So um, send her some serious orders. Going to try and log in. Um, but I will be leaving the call and, and taking any questions at the end um, in, her ab in her absence. So sincere apologies, but hopefully I can give you a good overview of our work, uh, both in Vietnam and Mongolia. Very good. Well, if you want to go ahead and get started, ladies and gentlemen, Olivia. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So um, forgive me, I've got notes in front of me to make sure that I cross off um, as much as I can in, in the space of time that we've got. But just to turn it, give you an overview of exactly who we are and why, why would you say we're unique? Um, so we're a partnership of people dedicated to serving children in need and those at risk of sexual and commercial exploitation by providing emergency and long-term shelter, medical care, nutritional rehabilitation, educational opportunities, vocational training and job placement. So we're one of the longest established um, and well-respected NGOs in both Vietnam and Mongolia. Um, Christina and the team's efforts to highlight the plight of children globally has assisted in motivating social change and reform in Vietnam and Mongolia and um, has in turn promoted the need for cross-cultural understanding, communication and shift in individual attitudes for government representatives to street and working children. It has provided life-saving and life-enhancing humanitarian services which has collectively impacted the lives of over 1 million people in areas of education, health and community development. So our programmes very much address poverty at a grassroots level and with a long-term focus on providing a nurturing environment for personal development. Our holistic approach to childhood development is at the core of our work and inspires a depth of care that goes beyond fulfilment of basic, basic physical needs. Um, all our programmes are designed to nurture all of our incredible young people in a way that recognises them as individuals with different needs, both physical and emotional, and values their very special human spirit, an individual human spirit. Um, all of our children who benefit from our programmes are deeply burdened by poverty, and in addition, many are orphaned and homeless and all suffer from disabilities and disease. Because of these factors, almost all are extremely vulnerable and at high risk of exploitation. So a little bit more about Christina herself and how we first um, started. So our founder is living. We are not a faceless corporation foundation. Um, she's very much uh, the driving force behind the foundation along with her family. What is most remarkable about what she's done is that it all started with one extraordinary person with an unstoppable drive and passion for children's rights. So Christina first arrived in Vietnam in 1989 with only a few hundred dollars in her pocket. In 1971, Christina started to have a reoccurring dream that would remain with her for many years. A dream that 18 years later would lead her to Vietnam to begin her work amongst the forgotten street children. And as that they were then known, the Buido, dust of life of Vietnam. So a little quote from Christina, which we use often. So she said, I came to Vietnam because of a dream I had almost 20 years ago, which then is now nearly 30 years ago. The dream told me to work with the street children of this poor, jangled, war-torn and disease-ridden country. You might laugh at that. You might say it was nothing but a dream and that only someone who is Irish would act on a dream as if it was a message from God. And you could be right. After all, my coming here was not anything I could explain then or anything I could explain today. I had a dream or a vision, if you will, that ordered me to Vietnam. 
So Christina herself was a child of the impoverished and notorious liberties of Dublin during the 1940s to 50s. So she herself endured a childhood of extreme poverty, loss, isolation, marginalisation and tragedy. After the early death of her mother when Christina was 10 years old and their father, a chronic alcoholic, unable to look after the children, Christina and her five siblings were separated and all committed to abusive state institutions and industrial schools where the cycle of abuse they suffered would be incomprehensible to many. Christina actually escaped these institutions several times, living on the streets and barring holes in parks at night to sleep out of danger. Later, in 1962, at the age of 17, she eventually flees to England, only to eventually find herself trapped in a violent and destructive marriage. Christina had three children who were all to eventually work with the foundation. So that leads us on to our current CEO, Helenita Pistola, and eldest daughter of Christina, um, who has worked alongside her mother since 1995. Helenita became CEO of the foundation in 2016 to initiate transition from a fam founder family driven foundation into an independent and sustainable NGO, and thus securing Christina and her family's incredible legacy of 30 years. So a brief sort of overview on why we're in Vietnam and why we are still in Vietnam. So as I said, after arriving in Vietnam in 1989, Christina sees firsthand the atrocities faced by the many thousands of street children roaming the streets and surviving in extreme poverty. Christina then established a foundation and dedicated her life to work amongst the lost and the forgotten children of a post-war torn embargoed Vietnam. So why are we still in Vietnam? So recent economic growth has allowed Vietnam to move from low income to lower min middle income but economic disparities persist. The rural poor are most affected by increasing inequality. Rural and ethnic minority populations are emerging from poverty at a much slower pace than their urban counterparts, and they continue to experience high rates of poverty, limited access to healthcare, high infant mortality, and poor access to education. So in addition, children with disabilities have not been fully integrated into the community and do not have ac adequate access to healthcare education and opportunity and such disparities underscore a broader concern in Vietnam that despite these strong aggregate economic growth indicators that measure holistic human development suggest that the country's progress has faltered in recent years. So a few top line figures for you. So who do we work with? So we work um, with those who fall through the cracks of this development and urbanization. So we've got a population of 92.7 million in Vietnam. So 300,000 individuals um, is, well, this is the number that the rapidly growing number of people living in slums in Ho Chi Minh City alone. 500% is the figure that land prices have increased in Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi in the 1990s. So migrants and those without ID are also individuals who are falling through the cracks. We've got un unregistered migrants who usually have unstable jobs and very limited access to social services and all must pay for these services. We also work with those um, individuals who don't have ID papers. So we've also got 1.75 million people under 18 years old in the country are labourers, and one third of children work an average of 42 hours per week. The majority not able to attend school. So a brief overview of why we're in Mongolia. So why did Christina go there? So in 1997, Christina visits Mongolia and sees firsthand the deprivation and poverty left behind after the withdrawal of the Soviet Union and the social economic collapse of the country as a result. The fracturing of the Mongolian economy, economy was reflected in the absolute breakdown of family values. Children were in the streets in thousands, seeking food and shelter from the bitterly cold winters of minus 30 to 50 degrees and below, down manholes below the city streets. The children were exposed and vulnerable to both Mongolia's unforgiving winter weather and unscrupulous adults or often older children who sought to abuse, exploit or otherwise take advantage of them. So Ulaanbaatar is Mongolia's coldest capital, capital sorry, it's the world, world's coldest capital city in the world with no food, no homes, no jobs and no foreign aid. The future of Mongolia and its children looked increasingly hopeless and desperately bleak. So Mongolia, as a result, plunged into crisis and the nation suffered. 
people were freezing to death. And driven by her own childhood experiences, Christina expanded the operations of CNCF in Vietnam and established the Blue Skies Gear Village as a safe haven for orphaned, homeless, abandoned, or otherwise at risk children in Ulaanbaatar. So why are we still in Mongolia 20 years later? So Mongolia's national debt is twice the country's an annual economic output, which stands at 23 billion at the moment. So the population of Mongolia is just 3.2 million, but 46% of the total population live in the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. So 30,000 to 40,000 is the number of people who migrate from the countryside to the city each year, a city already functioning well beyond its capacity. 36% of the population in Mongolia is living well below the poverty line. 40.3% of the population do not have sanitation facility access. 35.6% of the population do not have access to a drinking water source. 18% of children labour, child labour suffered by children aged between 5 to 14 years old. So what is the impact on Mongolia's society today? What do we deal with when we're out there and our team on the ground? So overpopulation, desperate poverty and large-scale unemployment. We deal with a lot of cases with alcoholism, domestic violence, child abuse and neglect and families living in extreme destitution. So children are exposed to a significantly higher risk of exploitation from predatory adults, organised gangs and sadly their own families a lot of the time. So to give you an overview of CNCF both in Vietnam and Mongolia, so we have 164 projects um, have been established um, since um, Christina first started the foundation. We um, have 20,000 children and families who are impacted annually. 900,000 children have been impacted to date by our projects and collectively 1 million children and adults' lives have been impacted to date. So our objective for the future um, Securing Christina and her family's incredible legacy of 30 years. There are many children that are still being marginalised, suffering in isolation, and who continue to be not denied even their most basic human rights. Education, healthcare, shelter and nutrition. We want to help more children that continue to be lost and abandoned and who remain in very desperate need of our help. As Christina repeatedly tells us, I could never have done what I've done without the investment and trust of so many good people over the years. And for that, I will forever be grateful to those who believed in me and my foundation. But most importantly, who genuinely believe in childhood and all child children born into our world deserve the right to be happy, safe, protected and surrounded by love. So I won't go into detail on, on all our individual projects, but um, hopefully the, the video that you guys have got circulated will, will give you a good overview into a little bit more detail into some of these projects. Um, I will say that so our, our sponsorship program, we um, currently have 2,222 children in total enrolled in both Mongolia and Vietnam. So um, we've still got obviously lots of children on the waiting list. Um, and the sponsorship program entails of uh, 38 US dollars a month. So less than uh, $1.25 per day, which is less than a cup of coffee for most of us. So a child sponsor can literally save and transform the life of a child, restore dignity within the family, and eradicate the terrible cycle of abuse and poverty once and for all, all through the highest quality of education, health, holistic care, and grassroots services. Olivia, do you want me to play yeah. that video now? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Can you all see and hear it? Do you all see and hear it? All right. Oh my God. All the babies tonight. All of them. Oh. He had uh, hydrocephalus. And then they, they walked through him with the shunts and then the whole thing. And he, he used to just lie down, do nothing. And now he's just gone very clever, just normal life now. What a great, fabulous foundation, great people. He had chronic kidney failure. 
and we take care of him when he was young, mature, when he came to the center. She's totally trapped. She moves on it. She is the bravest person in the whole world. sleep over there. They just uh, put some waste papers over there and just sleep on it. Okay, we're going to give the kids some clothes. That's all we can do for the moment, all right? All these kids are up from the manholes, all right? Come back now. I know your son. <laughs> You can see they're only tiny little things. They're both sisters, and uh, they've both been raped by the father. Systematically raped by the father. They're very badly damaged, may never be able to have children. I understand many, many things. So I'm asking you, this is, you're going to have to, make the best of this hard time in here okay you're going to learn you're going to study just get you right through it and then uh, i'm telling you we'll make it true no matter how hard it is
Cool. Great. That come to an end. Yeah, it's gonna go to another it's time. Hang on. We've come a long way since then. Uh, okay. There we go. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, any any questions? Hope you enjoyed that. Um, I just while while the video was playing, I at the, on my other screen, I looked up the uh, under Charity Navigator, uh, the Christine Noble Foundation. It's actually a fairly small foundation, isn't it? It is. It is. I think um, very much part of the reason why we're we're. Um, even though we've been around for nearly 30 years now, we've very much kept under the radar and um, it's very much been our, our ethos to the work we do. But I think um, the general changing world of charity and the position we're in now, we're very much having to start to communicate the work we do to ensure that, as I said before, that we can secure Christina's legacy going forward. Um, but yeah, no, we, we, are, we are relatively small. Our impact figures, as I mentioned, one of our, our, our yeah, the the main, um, what would you say, our characteristic is that, you know, we treat every child as an individual. We're not about huge impact figures. We're very much about um, making sure that every child's individual needs and, and aspirations are, are basically supported from the beginning. And Olivia, can you hear me? This is Rachel. Yeah, can you? Hey, hey, Rachel. Hey, I'm Rachel. I'm the general manager for the U.S. office. Um, I just joined in the call a few minutes after it began, but um, I was just going to say on Charity Navigator, that is, you're probably seeing our U.S. branch only because we're uh, the 501c3 here in the U.S. So we're all, all of our partner offices are registered in the home countries where we are. So for example, the U.S. office is registered as a 501c3 in the U.S. And therefore, I believe um, the figures you're seeing on Charity Navigator are probably just the U.S. office. So we are small uh -huh. in terms of international foundations and, and grassroots organizations, but you're probably seeing just one branch. Great. Yeah. But we've got, so just to, to um, follow up on that, so when, when Rachel says the branches, so we, we have a very small team in, in most of the offices, so one or two max, yes. max people who've been with the foundation for yeah, a very long time. Most of us say big CNCF family. Mm -hmm. Rachel, do you guys have ties to Rotary? We we have um, had different meetings with Rotary chapters in the past, and I know that our um, Hong Kong office has a lot of ties with Rotary there in Hong Kong, and I believe some of the other offices as well. So, <coughs> yeah. One of our members. Any other, any other questions behind the foundation or Christina herself? How have you uh, structured the legacy to continue? Good question. Very good question. So we were actually, um, we're just going through a transitional period at the moment. So um, in order to help um, ensure that Christina and, and her family are very much doing what they should be doing, which is on the ground and with the children and the projects. We've actually just um, formed an international board in Hong Kong. So um, this is a board which will basically help us, um, will support in the areas that we need to be supported in terms of delivering what we need to, um, to get that financial support that we need in order to continue our work. And yes, as I say, with them in place, it very much leaves the family and, and Christina to make sure that they're driving uh, the project forward. Very good, thank you. And if, Olivia, if you don't mind me adding in um, something to what you said earlier, if we still have time, um, I just wanted to point out when, a, when she was saying, you know, that the foundation and Christina really were fighting um, for and aiding the forgotten children of Vietnam, Mongolia, you know, this is truly the case for many, uh, especially those children and, and families still feeling the effects of the Vietnam War. Um, this is something I like to tell a lot of our different groups we meet with here in the U.S., especially because of the U.S.-Vietnam tie with the war. Um, 
you know, there are many regions that still feel the effects of Agent Orange. And one of our Vietnam programs is the Tay Ninh Residential Center for Visually Impaired Children. And we have a lot of children there who have, um, you know, birth defects and visual impairment from Agent Orange. So it just goes to show how great the need still is and how deep the repercussions of the war are in that country where children are still being born with, you know, different impairments today. And a lot of them, you know, have partial or total blindness um, and, and need some sort of assistance to be able not only to to have health care for these impairments, but also to get an education. Because as Olivia said, there often there's often a stigma or there's no resources available for children who have different types of diseases and impairments. So this is something that you know we really try um, to focus on as a foundation, and it's and it's one of my personally favorite projects because I really can see a the direct impact that that our office and all the other partner offices have on this particular cause. But um, you know, B, it's, it's providing resources for a, a demographic and a group of children that normally wouldn't have as many resources. So I just wanted to share yeah, that. Thanks. Definitely. I think to add on to that, so our flagship project in Ho Chi Minh City here so is the Sunshine Social and Medical Centre. So this was the, um, the first flagship project that Christina established. It was still in exactly the same location and building. And we have 80% yeah, of our children at the moment. So we have 54 residential children. So about 90% of those children, 95% are um, orphaned. Uh, and 80% of the children... Um, with us there are also um, affected by Agent Orange in some way, some form. So yeah, as you said, Rachel, whether it's um, uh, birth defects, uh, we have a lot of ch children with um, uh, cerebral palsy, um, hydrocephalus, both physical, um, physical and, and mental disabilities. So we have a full-time physio um, and we basically give them the best possible care that they could receive to make sure that you know, they, they reach their full potential and receive medical care that they wouldn't otherwise receive right. um, in a state orphanage. What type of interaction is there between the foundation and the government? Um, do you meet any resistance? Do you get any assistance? Um, what's that like? Yeah, another very good question. Um, so I think because Christina was the woman that she was, you can imagine 30 years ago, Vietnam was obviously a very different place to it is now. There are definitely different struggles, um, both before and now. But Christina very much, I think, blew the government away slightly by coming in here and, and you know, showing how passionate she was to help um, those who, who weren't otherwise being helped. So I think the government, from the very early days, from the very beginning, um, were very much inspired by her drive to make a difference. So with that, and, and obviously being the longest um, serving NGO in Vietnam, we very much have uh, very good um, relationships with the government. We work with partner, um, local partners in the different provinces. So this ensures that we're making sure that we're reaching the children who need it most, sure. um, as well as ensuring that they very much trust the work that we do, which is, you know, because we have been around for so long and, and many NGOs come out here and you can imagine don't last that long because, you know, working with the government here can be, can be demanding, but because we've got that history and trust with them, um, we're very much yeah, fortunate that, that we have that already established. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I must add that if, if anyone ever finds themselves in Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City, then we, we, we take visitors on around our flagship centre and, and um, welcome anyone who wants to come and visit us and the children. So we can give you, give you a view of, of some of our work firsthand. I have had uh, three uncles that served in Vietnam. And I came, I came into the military shortly after we came out of Vietnam. Um, I've always wanted to go there to visit. Oh, wow, we'd be delighted to welcome you here. Be an honor to have you. My one uncle says it's the best beaches of the world that are there. Actually, his, uh, well, she's passed away now, but his wife is Vietnamese. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, they're incredibly special people. You can't really understand until you, 
actually spend some proper time out here, but they're incredibly warm hearted and um, yeah, very, very special individuals. I think anyone who comes out here, you realize there's just a very much a family ethos behind their life. And, and that's echoed through the way they are with, with welcoming anyone who's a foreigner. I've, I've literally been welcomed with open hands and arms and, you know, it's, it's an incredibly special place. Olivia, where do you hail from originally? So I'm, um, I'm actually from England. I'm just outside of London. So I actually came out here um, beginning of last year just to volunteer at the foundation for two months. And little did I know it was going to change my life forever. So I very much, um, within the second week, had totally fallen in love with the work that the foundation does and then learned a bit more about the position we were in, in terms of what we needed to do to ensure our survival, which was very much um, communicating our work more. So my background is marketing and, and communication. So I, um, yeah, it didn't take much persuasion. So I literally went home, packed my stuff up, and moved out here. Um, so yeah, it's an amazing, amazing place. And, and the foundation has changed my life and just witnessing and being around the children that are being impacted daily by this one woman who started something nearly 30 years ago. I feel incredibly lucky to be involved in, in, a, in a partnership of amazing people who, who make, make a difference to those, those lives of children who need it most. I uh, very much understand is why I find myself spending more and more time either being there or, or planning on stuff for uh, the wilds of Guatemala where I'm working with uh, Mayan descendants. Fantastic. Do you go out there much? A couple times a year. So. Great. Very what cool. What do you find most rewarding? So anybody have other questions for either Olivia or, or Rachel? No, great, great presentation. Yeah, I'm Very sorry good. I missed it but I saw the pre, pre, pre <laughs> Well, we are recording it, Blair, so you got a chance to go back if you want uh, to. I did. No, I saw the or, pre presentation. Oh, you did see that pre, pre yeah. video, yeah. That's yeah. very cool. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, please, guys. if anyone has questions, do, do contact me, and we, you can find us on, on all the usual social platforms Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So um, keep up to date with our work on the ground here. So we're updating that daily, both here in the Mongolia. So you can see a bit more more behind the scenes of our work. Uh, Linda, who wasn't able to be online tonight because she's in a fundraising uh, project with our Rotary Club in Washington, she, um, oh. she's the one that brought you guys on board with, here with us tonight. And, and then she's also shared with us all the websites and such. Where we are as a Rotary Club is we're in the development as a club right now. We're not exactly officially a club yet. We hope to be uh, by the middle of the summer. And we have yet to determine what charitable uh, endeavors that we're going to be pursuing as a club. Uh, and I'm sure that your name is going to come up. Great. Thank you. Well, much appreciated. I think, yeah, very much, um, as we always say, we, without compassion of our donors, such as individuals like you guys, that we just physically cannot do our job. So much appreciated. We are in that position now where, um, it's incredibly exciting that we've got um, everything in place for a uh, continue our work going forward. But again, we do need we do need support. We can't do it alone. So, thank you very much. If there's any other questions that I can answer, always any, here for anyone anyone in the club. Anybody else have any final questions? No, very good, very good. Well, Olivia, I got one more question for you. Then, are you going to go back Please to bed? Do. Are you going to go back to bed now? <laughs> no, NGOs don't sleep. I've got to go to work. <laughs> 24 hours, but it's worth it. <laughs> All right. So is, and, and Thank then you the, very and, much. It's been an honor to take the call. Thank you very much. You're very honored. Uh, anybody have anything else for our club tonight that we want to talk about? John, go ahead. Un unmute yourself. Uh, Jerry, I sent you an email. I, I was on a webinar on uh, foundation stewardship, so I missed the first half. Um, 
I sent you an email showing the tentative, tentative, tentative route for the May ride. Um, can you show that? I, I, I'm not bit. smart enough to put it on Google Maps yet, uh, but Wait, it'll be people. Yeah. Let me show that on the screen here. And um, and the other thing I request is if you're going on the ride, would you email me please and just let me know? And uh, that's PDG John two zero one five at gmail. If you log into our club website, all you gotta do is click on his name and send an email to him. No, that too. <laughs> I'd like to get an idea. I think I've got some people coming up from Virginia. There's, a, there's his uh, email address. I think Bob Schreiner's coming. That's good. Yeah. Are you going to share this on the, the club site? Yeah, I wanted to get it out tonight, but uh, I will okay. do my best to get it on the club site. E email it to Linda. And she'll gotcha. pop it up on both the club and the IFMR site. Will do. She'll probably throw it up on the uh, Facebook page as well. Okay. Sounds I'm good. Gonna, I'm going to stop the share here shortly. Oh, man, looks like it's a great ride, and I'm going to miss it. Well, duty calls. You you know, you probably a well-deserved reward or award from your high school. You got to go. Uh, I I'd rather be writing than be awarded. The only thing that talked me into that award is uh, the teacher saying something about motivating the kids. So, Listen, you just give your bike to Rhonda and let her ride. <laughs> I don't know if she could do that. She'd probably have to stop and take selfie pics all the time. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people oh. do. How, how many Rhonda... How many people are Facebook friends with Rhonda on here? She's got more Facebook friends around the world. I'll tell you. More. <laughs> well, gang, I I'm, uh, guess it's uh, what we got tonight then. This is good. Uh, next week we have, what is this today? This is the third. Next week we have our, our business meeting. I'm hoping to have a more final version of our, uh, of our um, bylaws. Uh, for us to go over before I send them up to somebody on high to give a, a review as well. And I'd like to talk about the idea of doing a Rotorac club, um, sponsoring a Rotorac club. And those of you might not, were maybe not on board before. That's a big thing with our incoming president. Um, um, oh, his name's Barry Rasson out of the NASA area. And uh, it makes a lot of sense. And I think we'd be primed to do one um, and we can talk about more of that next next week. Uh, it would be a great week for a great way for us to start a farm team, if you will, as well as get a bunch of younger people on board that would uh, understand how we can make this technology work to a, a little better for us in this club. So there's a young man sitting there waving at us. He's in the farm team right now back there. Is that a young man or a young girl? He's hiding behind the nameplate. Good. <laughs> Why Nick. Oh, it's Nick. Hey, Nick. How you doing, buddy? Hello, Nick. Hey, Nick. Hello, Nick. How you doing, buddy? He's going home tomorrow, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you'll miss him. Oh, you're going to miss him. Yeah, I will. <laughs> We're about two and a half hours apart, Rory and Judy and I, and uh, I, I actually had a small, short cup of coffee with Rory today, halfway in between, in the middle of rain. <laughs> yeah. And snow. It's very cold out there. Did you hit snow on the way back today? Uh, no, but there was some people probably half hour ahead of me that decided their four wheel drives, all wheel drives, can't handle ice. They were in the trees. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we're gonna be glad we're trailering. Well, folks, what was it? I will catch up with you all next week then. Okay. 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 Okay, thanks good night. so much. Good night, good night everyone. Good night. Had a great evening, everybody. Bye, thank you. Butch, thanks for joining us. Oh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Now. We look forward to seeing you again the next thank time. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Rachel you. and Olivia. Very much appreciated it. Not at all. Have a good evening. You too. Have a great day. We hope it's a good day for us too tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Thanks you know. So Bye -bye. Okay. <laughs> Bye now. Bye-bye.